panel two now, our discussion to take us up to lunchtime, is going to be on the meaty subject of AI. You may have heard there is an AI act uh, doing the rounds here in Brussels, and we are going to try and dig into it in, in a sort of a more meaningful way when we think about consumers. So we've accepted AI is a thing in our everyday life. We're not turning back the clock. That's not going to be what the discussion is going to be about. It's going to be about protecting individual agency. Um, obviously, we all know how convenient and wonderful AI is, but it is, of course, made in our image. So we want to make sure we're creating artificial intelligence and not artificial stupidity. So. <laughs> To get cracking on that, I have a wonderful panel of speakers here. Starting down at the far end, Killian Gross is head of unit from DG Connect in the European Commission. Next to me, Mark Rottenberg is founder and president at the Centre on AI and Digital Policy from the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, we have Lina Eich, who is the head of Team Digital and Media at the Federation of German Consumer Organisations, a member of BERG, of course. William Vidonia is the head of Conduct of Business at Insurance Europe, which is the European Insurance and Reinsurance Federation. And last but not least, from the European Parliament, we have Sergei Lagodinsky. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me. Um, with AI, as I said, it's already in its everyday life. Killian, what should effective consumer protection look like? Does the AI Act guarantee a high level of consumer protection? It's a very open question. Thanks a lot. Um for inviting me and thanks a lot for discussing today um, this important topic because I think it's the right time. You know we are really in the hot phase of the negotiations and therefore every feedback, every discussion I think is very very useful and very desirable. Um, of course, if you ask me, as my team has basically prepared the, uh, the AI Act, I'm convinced that we have delivered um, a reasonable piece of work which would bring an increased um, consumer protection. I may perhaps just out there the key idea, what we, what we have in mind is basically what we want to achieve with the AI Act is that the level of consumer protection should be the same, notwithstanding whether um, a decision has been taken by a human or by a classical analog system. That's our, our starting point. So we want to overcome the particular features of AI, which are obscurity, dependency on data, um, the, sometimes a lack of human oversight and so on, so what is often described as these black box effects. So we want to open a bit this black box and make it as accessible as uh, it would be if there would be a classical decision-making situation. We have done so mainly by defining risks, so we have looked at the AI systems which are on the market, which are available, have identified different levels of risk, and we came to the conclusion that certain AI systems should be outrightly be forbidden, uh, certain AI systems are high risk, and they need to be checked before they go to the market, before they're placed on the market or put into use. That means we will develop requirements for them to make them trustworthy. Uh, and these requirements should be checked ex ante in a conformity assessment and controlled ex post. And there are other AI systems where we think there are, should be transparency obligations. Uh, for instance, the famous chatbot should inform the consumer that he or she is interacting with an, with an AI. And then there is a good part of the AI which we think at, as we stand is not really dangerous, where basically the market will solve the issue because it does not really touch on important issues. So this is a bit the, the basic idea of the act. This is, um, and I want to be very open, this is a, based on product legislation. So we took the, the main idea was that we looked a little bit what happened in product legislation where we have a lot of experience. You may know those who are familiarized, the new legislative approach and the old approach, so there are different approaches to it, but we have all in all decades of experience to make product safe. And we want to make the same now with AI. That's what we base ourselves on, on what we look at. And this is, of course, an, the interesting link now with the consumer protection. So how do we make sure that a product-based approach ensures the right level of consumer protection? And our key, here for us, the key elements are two, two thoughts or two pillars. One is that the key for the consumer is that the product is as good as it would be without AI, so as trustworthy. And that we try to ensure with quality requirements in the end to make sure that the AI works properly for a given objective. And the second element is that we provide in the AI Act um, a possibility for consumer protecting organizations, uh, for all public bodies defending fundamental rights to have access to the work of the market surveillance authority. So they can ask for information, they can ask access to what has been checked, and they can 
In extreme cases, if the documentation which is given um, is proven to be insufficient, they can ask to test again. We think that makes sense because these market surveillance authorities, these bodies are best equipped to, to follow up. They have the expertise, they have the data, but they have this legal obligation now to work together with consumer protection organizations to build here the link between product safety and consumer protection. And therefore, to sum up, because I understand we should not be too long, because I love, of course, to speak about the AI Act, and if you don't stop me, um, it may be too long. I perhaps stop here, and I'm happy to continue the discussion. Well, we have a lot of AI enthusiasts on this panel. Um, I'm going to jump around down to the other end, to our other representative from the EU institutions. Uh, Sergey, give me your overall perspective on, on what you think the AI Act is or isn't going to deliver. Well, I think the, mo the most important point is that we, uh, are st we started talking about setting standards uh, from our side on AI. Um, apart from this regulatory part, I do think that it is important also not to lose sight of the fact that we need something, uh, we need to have something that we want to regulate. Uh, it doesn't make sense to set standards um, for the world without having the technology and being, you know, actors in this, in this market. So we are very conscious about the fact that it is important also to support um, small um, and large enterprises who are actually developing AI. Uh, so the balance between innovation and regulation should be clear, but we do think that there are issues, even though we uh, um, generally support uh, the direction that the Commission has started, that when we go into details, there are certain issues where we think we're not there yet. Uh, we're not there yet, especially from the uh, um, human rights perspective, from the consumer's perspective, and this is where we are now negotiating with each other in the Parliament and later hopefully also with the Commission, trying to expand uh, the principles that I think are most important. The principle of transparency, a transparency which should not just be um, abstract in a sense, but it should be you know, transparency for consumers, uh, where the consumers can actually have uh, a human oversight uh, over, for example, fundamental rights assessment, something that uh, is important to us. Uh, an assessment is not just there for an assessment itself. Uh, it should be done, hopefully, also by a third party, for example, not by the producers themselves, because if I assess myself uh, whether or not my uh, uh, product is um, uh, risky, uh, or whether the impact on, on human and fundamental rights are there, then it's one thing when I am judging about this myself, and another thing is if there is a third party which is judging about this. We do think that we should talk, and we do talk about certain practices that should be banned beyond the practices that the Commission has proposed. Um, we do think that, for example, I'm, I'm just giving some kind of examples um, of the, the predictive practices on uh, um, social um, scoring uh, uh, should be more, um, you know, the invasive uh, parts um, should be should be more in details uh, regulated. For example, now it is limited to sub, as, as as you call subliminal practices. We think that it should go beyond that. Uh, so um, these are just a couple of questions that I want to mention, I know we shouldn't uh, go too long, but one thing, and I'm sorry, because being, being from the, I'm just not from the, uh, uh, from the European Parliament, I'm also from, from the Green Group. One thing where we do have our difference, and I do hope that it will change, is the environmental impact of AI, something that the Commission consciously put out of scope and does not want to deal, uh, saying there is no empirical evidence which would be um, enough to regulate on this. There is no time for us to develop uh, empirical evidence. We need to go into this, into this topic and to go into this topic as soon as possible because the CO2 uh, footprint is very high and just saying we don't want to deal with that is something that I think is also from the issues of, of uh, consumers uh, is also something that shouldn't be let out. We can discuss many other issues and details later. We can. We can even get into discussions about maybe applicability of precautionary principle and so on. But Lena, I want to give you your opportunity to <laughs> set out your stall first and, and tell us where your, where your thoughts are heading. Yeah, thanks for the invitation and also the opportunity to contribute the consumer perspective. I hope I, you can hear me good. Um, yeah, maybe 
to answer your first question, in general, like effective consumer protection, um, I think primarily consists of three aspects. And first of all, it is always good if consumer protection, consumer rights um, are considered right from the beginning of a design process. So, for example, right from the beginning of the development of an AI system. And of course, uh, I agree the compliance should be verified by independent conformity assessments. And the second important thing is that we need individual rights so consumers can seek redress. And the third thing is we need effective enforcement and therefore we also need a right to be represented as a consumer, for example, from consumer organizations. And now regarding the AI Act, um, we made several um, recommendations to strengthen consumer protection within the AI Act. And in our point of view, these are really important to also accomplish the stated objective to achieve a trusted AI. And maybe <laughs> to start with a positive thing we really ap appreciate is the broad definition the European Commission proposed because it does not only cover AI as machine learning system, it also covers algorithm-based decision-making system. And this is really important when it comes to consumer protection because also systems which are based on um, algorithm-based decision-making systems can be re really obscure. And if they are used in critical areas, they can have the same harmful effect as machine learning systems. And now, um, regarding individual rights and effective enforcement, I just want to underline that uh, consumers need to receive an explanation. Because without an explanation, without knowing, for example, uh, which data is used and is the data actually correct, you can't seek redress. And regarding enforcement, I just said it, we need a right to be represented as, as a consumer because enforcement is complicated and is also very expensive and not every individual consumer can enforce their rights by themselves. So we as VZBV, we really have um, good experiences. I think the most known one is um, the Volkswagen diesel scandal where we represented 260,000 consumers and therefore regarding the AI Act we really uh, are in favor of this right to be represented in order to enforce it in an effective way. Well, Mark, you've heard, I mean, some of the points are being raised here actually dovetail a little bit with rights we have under GDPR, but how far is the AI Act going to make a big difference? Well, I think the AI Act will make a big difference much in the way that the GDPR has made a big difference. Uh, we talk about the Brussels effect, which is the ability to adopt uh, regulation here that companies around the world uh, will need to follow. But I can add also, if you take a global perspective on AI policy, you will see that the EU AI Act is not the only game in town. Um, in fact, it was the OECD back in 2019 that set out the first uh, framework, global framework, uh, for the governance of AI. Now, in traditional OECD fashion, these are soft law principles, non-binding, uh, but also in OECD fashion, uh, they were quite influential and almost immediately taken up the same year by the G20 countries, which include Russia and China and Indonesia. And in those principles, you see a consensus position of more than 50 countries on issues like fairness and accuracy and transparency. Contestability mm. is one of the provisions within those guidelines that I think is a very powerful principle to protect people when there's an adverse determination by an AI system. But wait, there's more. Uh, because as soon as the OECD and the G20 got done with their work, UNESCO uh, began a comprehensive review of AI policy, picking up such issues as climate change and gender equity 
and in 2021 set out, I would say, the most comprehensive approach, 193 countries supported. It's a recommendation, again, a form of soft law, but there's a lot of eagerness in the UNESCO world to see implementation. And one of the sharp breaks with the UNESCO policy framework from the earlier frameworks, which comes up most certainly in the EU AI Act, is the need for prohibitions. The UNESCO recommendation on AI said flatly that AI systems should not be used for mass surveillance. AI systems should not be used uh, for social scoring. And I'll mention also that the former uh, High Commissioner at the, at the UN, Michelle Bachelet, has called for a moratorium on AI systems that fail to safeguard international human rights. So there is already, as we approach the EU AI Act, I would say consensus on several of the red lines that should be adopted. Now there's a debate, how many more categories do we include? Do we have, for example, uh, emotion detection or biometric categorization? Um, these are very interesting issues that I'm sure will be um, you know, considered by, by the parliament and by others as the act goes forward. Two other uh, reference points to just fill out our global picture here. Um, there is also the work at the Council of Europe, the Committee on AI, to develop a global treaty. Uh, we are involved in that process. Uh, we strongly favor that. Uh, good prior examples would include the Cybercrime Convention, which was very influential, as well as the Privacy Convention, the so-called modernized 108 uh, plus. And of course, with Council of Europe conventions, you have the possibility for signature by both member and non-member states. So there's the real possibility this past week, for example, US, Canada, uh, Japan, and others were participating in that discussion, anticipating eventual ratification. And finally, you know, I'd, I'd like to tell a, a happy story about what's happening in the U.S. advancing AI policy. Maybe you can invite me back for the happy story. Um, but the current story is, is a little less happy at the moment, uh, which is that we still don't have, at the federal level, I would say a proactive, compelling vision for the use of AI to promote social benefit. There's a lot of focus on training, a lot of focus on investment, a lot of focus on the competition with China, which I believe is real, but I think there's an insufficient focus on the US side for how we as a society would like AI to be deployed, which is why the focus of much of our work is around AI and democratic values. There was a very good proposal set out a year ago from the US Office of Science and Technology Policy called the AI Bill of Rights, essentially a plan to put in place some guardrails, safeguards, many of them, by the way, in the consumer protection realm, so relevant to this audience. Uh, but unfortunately, that proposal has not gone forward. We're in the midst of an effort. Part of it is advocacy and part of it is litigation to try to dislodge that. But uh, I guess the point here is EU AI Act, very important, likely to be influential, as is the GDPR, but also exists in this larger constellation of AI policy frameworks that are all moving forward. Well, a lot of different elements, moving parts there to take account of. Um, William, give us your perspective. I know with my other hat on as a reporter for the European Actuary how important AI is for the insurance industry, but tell us a bit about what, what's keeping you awake at night with regard to the AI Act. <laughs> Hopefully nothing. <laughs> there are a couple of things indeed in, oh. in, in the discussions now that are keeping me um, and probably the insurance industry awake also at night. Um, but let me just start with thanking the, the BUG team uh, for the invitation to Insurance Europe and myself to join this discussion, which as I think pretty much everyone said, is extremely timely and relevant now that 
DR Act is uh, being discussed and negotiated in the European Parliament and also in the, uh, in the Council. Um, I think from my perspective, uh, there are a number of different things that are uh, keeping me awake uh, at night as an insurance uh, industry representative, but also at times as a consumer. Um, what I want to make sure is that at the end of the day, we got an AI act that is providing an effective level of, of consumer protection, but still does not um, discourage the take up of AI by service providers and by the industry. And, and it's really a question of, of balance. Um, you asked a question about um, how to achieve this uh, right level of consumer protection in the AI Act. And the way I see it, it would be a combination of different elements. The first one would be transparency. The second one would be prevention. The third one would be supervision and enforcement. And the fourth one would be sanctions. In terms of uh, transparency, I think um, Kilian has already mentioned this is in the AI Act. Um, I think the most important and basic principle for me is to make sure that there is um, transparency so it is very clear for the consumer from the very beginning whether they are uh, facing uh, AI and for which purpose. Uh, and we find it in the AI Act proposal, Article 52, if I do remember well. And that's a basic foundation to ensure trust by consumers in the use of AI. The second one is prevention. So to make sure that in the AI Act we have sufficient safeguards um, that uh, give the confidence to consumers that they are well protected against potential unjustified harm that could result from the use of AI by the industry. Um, but at the same time that uh, these safeguards are well calibrated to not discourage the industry from taking up AI and depriving consumers from all the benefits can, that uh, AI can bring to them. Uh, and just taking the insurance perspective, I'd like to mention two different types of benefits that AI can bring to consumers. The first one is in relation to prevention, uh, because we see insurers have the possibility to monitor and anticipate risks thanks to the use of AI and also the uh, uh, increased availability of, uh, of data. And that gives the opportunity to insurers to give tips, recommendation, advice to consumers on how to reduce risk and how to reduce also the um, um, frequency and the intensity of the potential losses and claims that they may face. Uh, and all this with also the possibility to lower the insurance premium. So it's a kind of win-win for, um, for the insurance consumers in terms of uh, reduce losses, reduce claims, and uh, reduce insurance premium. The second um, advantage of the use of AI that we've seen so far is in relation to the uh, increased insurability and financial inclusion. And again, it's a combination of um, getting access to a new type or higher volume of data, relevant data, together with big data analytical tools. They have helped uh, insurers to get a better understanding of the risk uh, to be covered, to make um, uh, more accurate risk assessment, and that has helped the insurance industry to provide insurance coverage for risks that were considered before as uninsurable, so for which there was no insurance protection or too expensive insurance protection of unaffordable. And now, thanks to the use of AI, we see that these uh, consumers uh, have access to um, insurance protection, well, they had not before. So I think it's really important that the AI Act find the right balance in defining these safeguards. And I think this is actually what the European Commission managed to produce. We've taken a proportionate risk-based approach, defining the uses of AI which should be uh, prohibited because they're posing a risk which is unacceptable to society. These uh, uses of AI which should be submitted to stricter mandatory requirements because they're um, posing significant risk uh, on uh, fundamental rights and health and safety. And I think the Commission also did a great job in um, terms of identifying those risks that should be in this different list. And also taking a forward-looking approach or future-proof approach by um, proposing a methodology to update the list in the future. Just Quickly then to speak about the third and the fourth condition. The third one is supervision um, and enforcement that was already mentioned by uh, a number of the different speakers. Here, 
I think from the insurance industry perspective, it is very important to make sure that those who are supervising the use of AI in insurance have a good knowledge and expertise of not only the insurance business model, but also the insurance regulatory framework and the kind of risks that AI can pose when used in an insurance context and how best to address them. And I think the insurance supervisory authorities have this expertise, this knowledge, these skills, and they would be the best place to conduct this uh, monitoring and supervision and enforcement activities. And fourth, the sanctions. Um, we need to have dissuasive penalties, and I think this is also what Article 71 of the regulation is proposing today in case of infringement or uh, non-compliance. Um, so, really, I didn't mean to be flattering in any way with the European Commission. This is really not the way um, <laughs> Insurance Europe is usually acting, but I think um, the piece of work that you delivered uh, is actually pretty good. Uh, it is ticking a number of different boxes with safeguards, uh, but still not excessive, really proportionate, uh, and a text which is still leaving room for innovation and which is future-proof. So, for once, I would say, well done, Commission. Don't get too comfortable, Killian. Because <laughs> 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 I want to pick up on this question about and this, uh, this closed AI list of, of high-risk. Yeah, um, uh, uh, so, we're saying it's future-proof because it can be updated, but how flexible is this updatability of the list? Yes, uh, thanks a lot. It, it's not forbidden that somebody says something positive about the Commission. Huh? This is <laughs> uh, and perhaps uh, I will come to your question, but just one sentence, because I wanted to um, just to complete the picture about these uh, consumer rights. You will see uh, this week the Commission will as well adopt a revision of the Product Liability Directive, and you will see then as well a proposal for an AI Liability Directive. And this, I think, will complete the picture, because what we have suffered so far a bit, and that was, I think, always a bit of a weak point in the discussion. We started the journey in the white paper by saying we will have something on liability and we will have something on the, on the product side. Now we will close this, so you will then see um, the full picture and you will see there as well, I think, a number of um, important elements which will strengthen uh, the consumer ability to bring claims or to... Um, uh, um, to seek, seek redress. I don't want to do a sneak preview because this is for others than to, um, uh, to disclose this, it's but I think it, you, it, should be seen, it should be seen together. On your question, yeah. um, yeah. are we sufficiently flexible? Well, I think so, but I mean, you have to bear in mind that we had, when we drafted the AI, we had basically I, fundamentally two choices. And this is very interesting as well for the whole topic, I think, of today, how to regu regulate in digital ages, because you are dealing with topics which are extremely fast moving, and you don't really know the applications which will come up when you're regulating. And our processes in regulating are relatively slow, and the, the technological development and market developments are very, very fast. So some even think that we are not really up to, to, to the challenge. So we need to find a way how to cope with this. And we basically see two ways. One is that we have a rather open legislation where we define kind of principles and then leave it to operators to fill out these principles by self-assessments or estimates or risk analysis, which is nice because it's dynamic, but at the same time puts a lot of burden on the, uh, on the individual market participants. And we think that is what we learned from the public consultation on the white book. What the business and the developers and the innovators told us is we can live with obligations and regulation, but we need to know in advance what we have to do. So the, the worst, what, we can, what you can do is un create uncertainty. We would like to have clear obligations. As long, we may not love them, but as long as they are clear, we will be able to, to accommodate them. So <clears throat> we didn't really follow that option. And the other options, of course, have we try to be precise, and that's what we do with our annexes, that we identify what is high risk. Now, this is, of course, <clears throat> if you read Article 7.2, where we try to identify the criteria for our risk analysis, a very challenging task because we are horizontal, we have lots of different use cases, um, and we have a number of important criteria which we have to assess. So we did that in the impact assessment because our, our line was to say we can only put up cases where we are convinced that they are risky. Because you, you have a lot of speculation, you have a lot of literature where people think this may be risky in the future or this may develop in a way which is risky, but we try to be facts-based. So we want to regulate when we think there is a risk and we need to intervene and not because we anticipate that there may be a risk and we regulate already in advance. So what we have done is a, is a, a, 
to set up a list of the cases, the use cases where we already now can certainly identify that they cause risk, like biometric identification, for instance, or uh, AI tools used in recruitment contexts, uh, which we put on the list. At the same time, we have set criteria to assess future cases. These are in 7.2, and we will, um, by delegated acts, once a year, we will look into this and then do impact assessment on individual cases and develop them further. And here we will, of course, work together with civil society. We will certainly set up an expert group with different stakeholders to have this feedback from civil society. So this is a process. So I think we should see this AI act, and that's, from our perspective, a strong point. It's a horizontal framework, which we can then dynamically fill out um, as we go along and as we identify new challenges. But we don't need to come up with a completely new legislation each time, which will cost us a lot of time, but we will have a good framework and we can then adapt it dynamically to new challenges. That's a bit the idea which is underlying. Well, I'm thinking a little bit in terms of things like an emergency break, for example, and it's, it's a little bit hypothetical, but uh, an NGO or civil society organization identifies, I don't know, a new channel as being used in the context of the Ukrainian war and, and the Russian aggression, and we're seeing, oh my gosh, suddenly this particular app or this particular system, this AI system is being used to disrupt something. I'm, referring, I'm sort of relating it back to something that's happening now, but we don't know in the future. Is there the facility for the Commission to say, right, emergency, something needs to be assessed and put on the list in weeks, not months or years? No, no, we, we have this. I mean, in the system which we have set up, the implementation is mainly for the national um, authorities, so the market surveillance authorities and the uh, notifying authorities, notified bodies, of course, and on the European level, we do um, a, a strict coordination to ensure consistency and coherence. But we have procedures in place that you can go to the market surveillance authority and the market surveillance authority can, in case of emergency, suspend the use of an AI system. Then there is an escalation process, so they need to inform other market surveillance authorities and then ultimately the commission. So either bring it back in line or take it definitively off. So these, these kind of procedures are foreseen. The idea there is, of course, this should be an emergency, so you would go beyond the rules because there is an, uh, an, an acute crisis and you should then do the proper assessments as soon as you can do that and go back to, to normal. But this is, of course, foreseen because we all know um, and we, we, nobody has a crystal ball which how an AI system can turn into something dangerous. And even if it's assessed and even if it has been declared compatible, it's not completely excluded and we have to be fair with ourselves. It's not completely excluded that at a certain moment there may be other uses or other aspects which have been overlooked. So there must be this escape clause that you uh, can intervene. Indeed, none of us knew a few years ago we would be carrying around our vaccination methods in our phones. Um, so do let me turn back to you and, and talk about some of these, <coughs> these high risk activities. Um, Article 5 has identified certain things that we want outside the bounds that are prohibited for law enforcement. Um, but you see things like biometric identification or emotional surveillance um, happening in a consumer context, in, in a commercial context. Do you think we're going far enough there? What are the concerns about yeah, I prohibited for one, should we not prohibit it for another? I think we can start with categorizations there. I, do, I don't think that these practices should be labeled as high risk because this places them in a different chapter. I think we should talk here about uh, some banned activities or activities that should be banned that we should broaden. And uh, there we um, think that biometric categorization systems, I mean, first of all, it's, it's very good that we have a biometric ban uh, which is already there and, and, and that we have a bipartisan kind of agreement that we want to go there and, and, and to support it. Uh, from the parliament side, but uh, we have certain practices that we think, we being um, friends of consumers, let's put it this way, <laughs> uh, in the parliament, <laughs> um, it, that, that should be banned. For example, biometric uh, categorization systems that are based on gender recognition. Uh, and of course, uh, what was already uh, um, mentioned here, emotion recognition systems. I mean, we cannot, uh, um, tolerate and we cannot accept that, for example, there are certain uh, pseudo-scientific practices who promise that, you know, there will be a recognition of sexual orientation based on, on, on facial features. This is something that we should be very clear and outspoken uh, that it's not about high risk, it's about being banned and not part of something where we want to work. The same with uh, uh, the, word, uh, the, the, the world of employment. 
if we are talking about, um, for example, practices of constant observation of employees uh, or um, some would even uh, go further, constant observation, ba AI-based observation of uh, you know, schools and students uh, writing tests. Uh, there are uh, some colleagues who say we, these are not practices that we want to tolerate, even if we uh, give them a step of a, of a high risk. Um, so uh, I, I think this is the main, uh, one of the main points of how, where do we find the balance and how do we broaden the catalog of practices that should be banned and we don't want uh, uh, to have them as part of our uh, regulatory system. The question that, of course, of a practical nature is what I mentioned at the beginning. We can ban things, but how uh, will it work if China would say, okay, we're, gonna, we're not going to ban them, uh, we're going to be producing those things. And, and there, I think, we should also break out of the paradigm of uh, just, you know, Liebe Committee and IMCO committees talking to the Commission. We should start talking about what I call international digital uh, affairs, global digital policy, because it's, it, it, it should be clear to us that by, uh, you know, just regulating it in our cozy EU environment does not set a global standard per se. We need international uh, uh, tre treaties and efforts uh, to establish those, because those should be global bans. It will not be easy, uh, but, but we should be working on that going beyond this little nitty-gritty details that we're talking about. But from the consumer's perspective, basically the new consumer's protection is a global consumer's protection. It cannot be just a continental European Union consumer's protection. And this is the first uh, uh, step in, in that direction which we should be uh, following through. Well, we're at a consumer conference today, but of course not all citizens may be classified as consumers in every situation. Um, and Mark, I want to bring you in in this global context because I know the US has there's a different approach to defining who or which citizens are subject to which law protections. In Europe, we think a law should be for everyone. In the US, they've got very different standards for those resident in the US and those not in terms of things like surveillance. So how is the AI Act going to fit into that nexus? Well, I don't think the AI Act will be directly impacted uh, by how we are writing privacy laws in the United States these days. Uh, Jen's uh, references to, um, I, I thought it was a mistake actually in the proposed American Data Privacy and Protection Act some of you may have heard about. This is uh, pending federal privacy legislation. Uh, quite significant actually. It's been really 20 years since we've seen a federal privacy bill with prospects of passage. Uh, but what was striking about this bill, and I've written consumer privacy bills in the U.S. Senate, is this is the first one that actually said the coverage is only for U.S. residents. And when someone said to me, Mark, did you see this in the bill? I said, I'm sure that's not correct. You, you misread the bill. <laughs> and then I went back and I said, well, actually, that is in the bill. And I was kind of astounded. Sometimes in U.S. surveillance law, and I think this is understandable, when you're talking about intelligence gathering and law enforcement authorities, you might distinguish between your national citizens and non-citizens. But that, um, that's quite bizarre. I just wanted to, to come back, though, to the comment uh, that you made about the international treaty. And part of what I'm trying to explain here is to say that there are a lot of processes moving forward simultaneously in the AI policy world. And there's no question that the EU AI Act is a very significant process and will be very influential. But I think it's important to understand it really isn't the only. And you look at the deployment of AI systems in Asia and Africa, countries have ambitious plans, they're making investments, they're setting up AI hubs, they're getting support from China and China says, well, you know, we think mass surveillance is, they don't call it that, um, but we want secure cities. We want people to feel safe. We want to reduce crime. We've developed technologies that deal with what seems to be a particularly serious problem in the West. And then you come along from a Western country and you say, well, we have 
you know, beliefs about mass surveillance and what that means for dissent and political protest. And my concern is that if we don't do a better job advancing the case for AI based on democratic values, mm -hmm. a lot of those countries will actually say, well, we've heard both sides. We'll take the secure city over the smart city, let's say. And that's happening um, already. I was at a, a big AI conference last week in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. And there was a lot of discussion in Saudi Arabia about gender equity, <laughs> about uh, uh, climate change, uh, about promoting AI systems that are beneficial. I was, you know, frankly surprised. But I think there is a competition taking place for AI leadership that is, to be sure, very much about technology and innovation and dominating key market sectors. But there's also a competition taking place for values and leadership and persuading people that this will be in their interest. Um, and I think it's, you know, you have to really dig in and push forward. I'm gonna say something, I hope it's not too controversial and I don't know if you know, your office was directly involved, but you know, we were at the meeting last week with the Council of Europe in, in Strasbourg working on that treaty initiative, which I think is also very important. And uh, word got out that the uh, commission was not happy that the Council of Europe was doing a legal instrument uh, similar to the AI Act. And so the EU delegates at the Council of Europe meeting were basically instructed to kind of hit the pause button and not make any uh, comments to move that process forward. I think that's a big mistake. I mean, there may be some questions of coordination and turf between the work of the Commission and the Council, but I would say on the European side, you absolutely want the Council of Europe to be putting forward a strong human rights framework for AI at this moment in time. I really don't, don't see any benefit in that decision and I hope it will change. Yeah, you want to? <laughs> yes, I can perhaps come back to this. Um, I was in close contact with the team. I mean, we are absolutely supporting the Council of Europe uh, work on the um, on a convention on AI. There is no doubt because we this allows us, on the contrary, this allows us to go beyond the, the market of 27 and uh, to reach out to third countries. You know, we work with the U.S. on the CTC, but we, of course, we know that there were, uh, was a substantive delegation from the U.S., from Canada, in Strasbourg. The only the only thing which is important for us, and we have the same experience under the data protection regulations, of course, to make sure that for the 27, that the regulation which we are discussing, the AI Act and this future convention are compatible, because otherwise we, we create a legal uh, conundrum for our, for our citizens and undertakings, because we, we want, of course, to, to obey then to the future convention, but at the same time, member states, citizens will have to, um, to implement the, the regulation. And what, what was now, and therefore we, the coordination is key, and for the coordination, what we need is, as a commission, we need a mandate from the, Europe, from the Council, from the member states, in order to authorize us to, to run the negotiations. And that's what we're doing. We have worked throughout summer in order to speed up the process, so uh, to, to be quicker. So we have, we have a draft mandate on the table in the Council, and as soon as the, the Council has authorized us to speak on behalf of, of the Union, we will take that up and will engage actively in these negotiations, because we don't want to at all to stop this. But and from an international perspective, it's of course a bit unfortunate if 27 member states and the Commission um, present divergent views in such a negotiation because in the end, if we have an AI Act, there will be one AI law in the Union because we want as well to create an internal market for AI. So this is the way we have to, do, to organize this coordination, but I think the objective uh, cannot be put into doubt and we certainly don't want to delay or uh, prevent this process. On the contrary, the mandate the objective of the mandate is that the Union will be able to exceed the Convention. So the, the purpose is that we can negotiate in view of exceeding afterwards as well the Convention of the Council of Europe. So if, if I could say just one more word, because I recently went through this process with both the Council of Europe on the Modernized Privacy Convention and the Commission on the GDPR to you know, update the Data Protection Directive. And my recollection is that there was very little conflict, that both efforts moved forward in parallel, and 
these were both good outcomes. And I think this strategy right now is actually quite dangerous. I think you really want to see that convention move forward as quickly as possible because these other policy um, initiatives are not hitting the pause button. In fact, artificial intelligence itself tends to hit the fast forward button. It says, just let me go, you know? And uh, I think we really need to move quickly to put necessary regulation. But in place. don't, if I'm, I'm going to let Sergio, because I know you have to leave. Yeah, very I'm, shortly. I'm very yeah. sorry. I have a next meeting. But don't you think that the, the, the main point in terms of international coordination is a coordination which is transatlantic? Because if we have a, you know, if we're talking about narratives, we're not going to win narratives uh, of uh, our, you know, of the global south without us coordinating with the United States vis-a-vis -vis China, because this is how the competition of values is going to look like in this area. Well, I, that process, of course, has been underway at the Trade and Technology Council, the TTC, and there was a good statement, joint statement, uh, US-EU in Pittsburgh in the fall of 2021, but there hasn't been much progress exactly. since. And, you know, frankly, the other part of the story just, just to share with you is that one of the things I've observed in studying global AI policy is I think China may be the most clever of all nations, not simply because it's seeking to dominate AI by the year 2030, that's explicit, that's industrial strategy, but China is also seeking to put in place the regulatory frameworks that help cement that advantage and displace mm. the Brussels effect with what some have called the Beijing effect. Mm -hmm. And that process is underway right now. So, you know, people waiting to see, can we get agreement here? Let's pull everyone in first. I don't see the Chinese waiting. I think they just keep moving forward. So I'm going to give you a final word before we let you run off. Um, I, <laughs> thanks for this. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, um, I, I, I do think that this, this global dimension is going to be the decisive dimension, but this global dimension has to be a dimension that makes us to a unique selling point. Uh, and this unique selling point for, for Europe, the, the, with GDPR, we did the first uh, step. And now uh, it's not just data protection, it's also consumers' rights and fundamental rights. And we should be self-conscious about this. I know that the, the uh, businesses uh, complain uh, that they say this is a disadvantage, uh, but I also see how, for example, our American partners do take those issues on board, our regulators from the, from the American side uh, and from many other countries. And this should give us more, uh, I would say, you know, self-esteem, kind of a European self-esteem. I don't speak in those terms usually, but in this particular uh, situation, I do think that we should realize what a unique chance we have to make a global imprint by sticking to human-centered and consumer-centered uh, structures. I will leave it here, uh, and uh, I hope that I've provoked uh, certain discussions and fights with, uh, <laughs> with our business colleagues. Thank you very much, and Thank I'm sorry I have to. Thank you for <laughs> joining us. Um, I am going to bring the conversation, it's gone very geopolitical <laughs> here, um, so I'm going to try and bring it back down to the day-to-day, -day, Lena, and a lot of the day-to-day -day AIs that we use as, as citizens, as consumers, are not considered high risk by this. Is there a gap that you think needs filled? I'm putting words in your mouth because I think you're going to say yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. Now, um, in our view, actually, the AI Act largely ignores people in their role as a consumer because uh, it is driven by the desire to protect fundamental rights, safety and health, and that's also good. But it's not enough, it's, it's too narrow, because the violation of consumer rights is largely ignored, actually. And we see this in several points. For example, in the prohibitions in Article 5, A and B here, the exploitation of people's personal weakness with an AI system is only covered if it causes physical or psychological harm. But uh, it actually ignores uh, that also the economic and social situation can be explored. And so 
this also has to be covered um, because this can cause like really potential harm to consumers. And so therefore these prohibitions should include economic losses, welfare losses, and of course the violation of consumer rights. And just to give you an example, um, think about AI systems recognizing um, and financially exploiting people who are tired or mourning or people with a personal predisposition to compulsive gambling. So these AI, AI acts should be put more emphasis like um, on the economic harm and violation of consumer rights. And we also see this um, regarding like the Annex 3 and the list of use cases. Um, therefore, in our view, the list has to be completed. It has to um, take into account like the significant economic welfare losses consumer can face if their rights are violated. And so these should be considered as high risk. And what we concrete um, propose is to add insurances um, to the high, high risk um, Annex 3 list and <laughs> systems for financial investment and also payment and debt collection systems because um, yeah, it, 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 they can really harm like economic welfare losses to consumers. And uh, so in our view, um, we should consider them as high risk. And of course, also Article 7, when it comes to the updating of future um, high risk cases should consider uh, consumer rights and also economic uh, harm um, as a criteria when it comes um, to uh, the identification of future high risk applications. Kim, so what do you <laughs> say to that? <laughs> I say thank you very much, you know, for <laughs> keeping me awake at yeah. night. That's very kind of you. I think this is really kind of the elephant in the room. Yeah, um, Jane, when you read mm -hmm. the questions before about, you know, what is keeping me awake at night, uh, that would be the point, whether insurance should be uh, listed as high risk or not. Uh, and I know this is something which is being discussed now mm -hmm. in, in the Council and also in the European Parliament. Um, here, I'd just like to, to refer to a letter that was sent by the European Insurance Supervisory Authority, EOPA, which, believe it or not, I don't think we can suspect of uh, any um, uh, indulgence vis-a-vis -vis the uh, European insurance industry. Um, at least this is really our perspective. They're pretty tough uh, in their activities, supervision uh, activities, but also in their advice to the European Commission when it comes to uh, ensuring a very high level of consumer protection in all different respects. But they sent a letter in July to the co-legislators saying that insurance should not be added to the list of high risk at this stage. And they made a number of different arguments to support uh, their call to the co-legislator. The strongest one was uh, definitely in relation to the existing regulatory framework in insurance. Um, you know, it would not be correct to say that the insurance industry has been using AI as such for, for years. Um, the real AI is actually quite in its infancy in the insurance industry, but we've been using um, similar techniques, uh, actuarial modeling, statistical modeling techniques. I know it's pretty boring, uh, but this is what we've been doing for years uh, for underwriting purposes, for risk assessment purposes, for pricing purposes. And for all these years, and I'm speaking about decades and sometimes even centuries because the insurance industry is one of the oldest business on earth, um, there have been uh, supervisory authorities identifying the different risks um, that were resulting from, from the use of these different techniques and addressing them. And this is what EOPA has continued been doing for the last years, also in the wake of, of AI. Um, and when I'm speaking about the regulatory framework which is in place, and you know, I'm not thinking only about the cross-sectoral legislation like GDPR and others in the field of data protection and privacy, or about the um, um, equal treatment uh, legislative framework with the gender directive, with the um, uh, racial um, discrimination directive and all the others. I'm also thinking about this specific insurance uh, legislation, the Solvency II Directive, which is mm -hmm. 
also requiring insurers to have effective system of governance in place, which are requiring insurers to have very high level of data accuracy and quality about the insurance distribution directive, which is addressing the issue of fairness. So really imposing on insurance distribution channels to treat customer in an honest um, and fair manner uh, with a number of different requirements when it comes to the development and the design of the products and the distribution of that products. You know, from the very beginning of the uh, marketing phase or product development phase to the uh, after sales um, phase. And all these different requirements apply also when AI is being used and they ensure that AI is actually being used in a fair way. Um, so this is really the element that EOPA, or Supervisory Authority, brought forward to claim that insurance should not be uh, included in the list of high risk now because there are safeguards already in place that are preventing um, um, the risk of uh, consumer detriment or harm on the fundamental rights and health and safety of consumers. And on top of that, you have also the effective practical supervision by the EOPA and by the national insurance supervisory authorities, which are extremely active and are paying a lot of attention on how AI is being used by the insurance industry and are standing ready to address the potential risks that could stem from that. If, if you don't mind, I'd just like to add also an aspect, uh, which I think is very important when it comes to the use of AI. Uh, whether AI is being used or not uh, in insurance, you always have a human controlled process in place, which is there to uh, review, check, and challenge also the um, outcome of any decision uh, in the insurance sector. And this is also taking place when you have AI which is being used. So just to take a concrete example, you have a car accident, a minor one, of course, but your car is still slightly damaged. What you do is that you can take a picture of this damage on your car and you send it to the insurance company through the uh, insurance company app. And then you have the AI system which is assessing um, the picture and is able to uh, put a price on the reparation that would be needed for your car. So to give you a quote for a compensation. If you're not happy with these quotes, there is always a possibility for you to ask for the insurance company to send a loss adjuster on site to check the damages of your car and to have a different quote or similar one at the end. Mm -hmm. So the process is, and the decision is always reversible uh, when it comes to the insurance industry, at least in Europe. Perhaps a last point, so that would be the main reason why I think insurance should not be uh, included in the list of high risk at this stage. I agree that we will need to monitor the situation extremely tightly also, and if there's any new emerging increased risk that would pop up, uh, I think it's important to make use of the system in Article 7 uh, and the methodology to check whether then some use cases in insurance would need to be included in the future in the list of high risk, but taking into account the existing regulatory framework. Just on the international dimension, because I thought the point was, was really interesting, and also Sergei said that you know the industry is keeping complaining about that. I think what is really important for my industry is that we have a level playing field uh, in the European market. Um, so we can really rely on the fact that everyone is competing on, on the same foot and that consumers would be equally protected whoever the providers are um, when they are in the European market. And also I would like to make sure that policymakers pay attention to not having excessive uh, requirements, but really well calibrated requirements in the European market because the experience and the skills and the expertise that we're going to develop in Europe, if we have excessive requirements, are going to be lagging behind what our competitors at international level would be able to, to develop again in terms of skills and competencies and experience with AI. And we should not be put at a disadvantage here. Okay. Um, in a nutshell, the insurance industry is already really heavily regulated. Um, I don't want to stand too long between you and your lunch break, but are there any burning questions in the room that you really must put to our panelists right now? Does anyone want to get their hand up? Yes, there is. Yeah, so sit down here. Come to the back. Ursula Pahi from Biuk. Well, thank you very much for these discussions. I cannot avoid, but I have to talk about insurance here. <laughs> <Please. second. laughs> um, I mean, first of all, not surprised that you, uh, William is very happy with the commission because uh, insurances are not qualified as high yeah. risk, as you know. What does that mean? 
and William said there is transparency ensured for consumers, which I'm sorry, I have to say that is not the case. So if you're not a high risk product or sector, there is basically no specific yeah. requirement that would apply to you. So you're covered uh, by the AI Act in the sense that member states are precluded from going any step further and maybe regulating insurance industries that use AI systems. So just to explain why Wilhelm has this smile on his face, right? I think that's important to understand. Uh, and of course the insurance industry is heavily regulated, but that does not lead to consumers when they are confronted with insurance products that use AI, that the consumers would have a transparency right, a right to transparency, a right to um, object, a right to, uh, to, to explanation, a right to redress, a right to complain against these products or AI systems in these products. So we don't have that. So if we don't have it in the AI Act, they will be nowhere. And so this is why it's not sufficient to say the insurance industry is heavily regulated. And on top of that, if I may say, because Kilian referred to tomorrow, there will be two very important proposals on liability uh, for products, but also specific proposals for um, AI liability. And let's say the insurance industry would use general purpose AI. So let's say you would have a Google system that insurance industry would use. Um, there will be no strict liability as we have it with other products that use AI systems, but only fault-based liability of the insurance industry. And that means consumers would have to prove that the insurance are um, um, ignorant or neglecting mm, uh, or um, intentionally harming consumers, which will be impossible. So I think the insurance really, really they are getting well off here from, from the regulatory side. So um, I think that's not what we would like to see with Julian on the chair. Thank you. Julian, do you have a quick response to that before we go to lunch? <laughs> well, uh, thanks a lot, Ursula, for this, this intervention. We, um, we have not taken insurance, when you know our position, we have not taken insurances on, on the list because when we did the impact assessment, we did not find sufficient concrete elements that it's currently, there's currently a need to do so. This is not, uh, I would a bit, little bit contradict you, is not directly related to the fact that there is already a lot of regulation because this holds true practically for all high risk areas. And if you, mm -hmm. the banking sector is not less regulated than the insurance sector, so then and we have credit worthiness identified. Our objective was to be very targeted and only to take even small cases because we take, for instance, from the banking sector, we take only credit worthiness assessments, which is just a, a, a tiny share because we've, we found there concrete evidence that there are cases. And then we have this Article 7 methodology where we want to extend and we wanted to start, not small, but we wanted to start on a solid basis of, of evidence. That's, that is the reason, but we don't exclude at all that at later stages, uh, when we have more evidence or different evidence, insurances may be included, and the, the, fact, the very fact that they are highly regulated would not be a reason not to include them. And you are, of course, all aware that there are very intense discussions now in the Parliament and in the Council on this insurance uh, issue, which go beyond my, uh, the scope of my, uh, my influence, of course. Uh, these are the co-legislators. They will decide what they want to do, so I... It's a bit of an open race, I would say, what happens to the insurances in the end. William, very briefly. <laughs> very all brief. hungry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, two points. Uh, one. First one, I, th I think we've been uh, knowing each other for some years, and you know that whatever happens, whatever the context, I keep smiling. So I'm not here smiling just because I'm happy, but uh, I'm smiling because this is by my very nature. Um, <laughs> the, the, the second point is on uh, the... Um, different potential issues uh, that could be created by not having insurance in the list of high risk. I think we would need to take time to look at the insurance sectoral specific legislation to see what's in it and what is being applied to the insurance companies today because most of the issues that you mentioned in relation to complaints, to redress, to transparency, you actually find a response to these questions in the insurance distribution directive and the delegated regulations already. And they apply you know, in a digital neutral way. So whether um, big data analytical tools are being used or not. And on top of that, we know that AOPA is coming up with a lot of different recommendations and guidance which the insurance industry has to abide with. So in a nutshell, you know, I understand your concerns, but I think it's also very important to look at what exists already, whether these concerns are being addressed or not. 
If there would not be a dress, then I would understand, you know, we need to do something. But if there are dress, I think we need to take stock of that and proceed on that way. Sorry, I wanted to be short. That was okay? <laughs> yes. yes, that was okay. <laughs> well, I think we are crossed a lot of, uh, crossed the Atlantic a couple of times, we crossed a lot of sectors yes. and a lot of different questions, both political, commercial, con citizen, consumer. So we're going to take a break and let everybody <laughs> digest what they've heard. Lunch break is until two o'clock. Please be back here for our keynote. And then we've got another couple of panels this afternoon. One about data, again, empowered by data and consumers in control. And the other one about enforcement. And I know that's also one everyone wants to hear, as well as our, our great keynote speakers. So thank you very much. Big round of applause for our panelists.